<laughs> Seventh time's the charm. Okay, so hi you guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, this is the first official Vintage and Color video. <coughs> Excuse me. Y'all, I have COVID. I'm gonna just go mm. ahead and, and tell y'all straight up. I have COVID. Um, I am trying my hardest to power through it for this video. I've been wanting to do this video mm. for a month now. I've had the script written and it's not finished. So this is gonna be a part one. <laughs> But I've had the first part of the script written for a month and I just, I don't know, like I haven't felt inspired to actually sit down and record it. But now that I literally am forced to do it, I was like, well, what better time to sit down and record the script than now when I don't have a choice. So, um, yeah. Hi. <laughs> well, this video is very special. For one thing, it's the first video where I'm kind of showing my face and associating my face with Vintage and Color brand, really embracing what I want to do on YouTube. It's, this is special. This is very special. Um, so I'm excited. Um, and thank you guys to anyone who's come over here from the Vintage and Color TikTok. Um, thanks for the patience. Uh, thanks for the support, the comments, the the... The conversation, uh, <laughs> you guys are a lot, y'all are so fun. Um, and I enjoy very much the little community that we built over there. And I'm hoping that that community translates over here. So um, today we are going to be talking about the history of makeup in the black community or the history of the black beauty industry as it pertains to makeup. <laughs> because, and I have to make that distinction because I feel like there is, um, sorry, my phone is going off over here and it's distracting. I have ADHD. But I feel like <clears throat> there is plenty of uh, content of about the significance of hair in the black community and the history of hair in the black community. So I, I wanted to talk about the make the aspect of like the makeup industry in the black community and the significance of that. And I got like my idea to do this topic when I was going through old Jet Magazine issues to basically define content for my Vintage and Color channel. Um, and I saw an advertisement for Hi Hat Cosmetics. Hi Hat, what is it called? Hi Hat Powder? It was Hi Hat, Hi Hat Jockey, whatever. Hi Hat Cosmetics. Um, I had always known about Hi Hat Cosmetics, but I did not know that Hi Hat Cosmetics had foundations for black women um, it's a black brand but I didn't know that they made foundations to be honest with you I never really because it's hard as hell to find you know foundation that's darker than a paper bag now right so imagine 60 70 80 years ago how hard it was for like our grandmothers and great-grandmothers to find their complexion if they were darker skinned women uh, as in foundations. so I knew there was makeup brands and beauty products for black women, but I didn't know that there was foundation back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I did not know that. Um, so, But what was weird about it was it wasn't just foundation. It was almost like it was skin-matched bleaching cream because I'm going to insert the, I'm going to insert the advertisement here, but as you can see, it, the skin, like the shade is called tantalizing dark brown. So it's clearly for someone of a darker hue. But as she's putting it on, the model, you see that her face is gradually turning lighter. So it's like it was color matched to her complexion, but with the intention of lightening her skin. And so it's really weird. So it's like it's foundation bleaching cream. And it made me wonder, it made me curious, it made me think like, you know, what did black women used to do for makeup back in the, back in the day, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s? Um, you know, how did, were foundations and all that, like, you know what I'm saying? And it made me kind of do my thing, one of my things where my brain starts going a mile a minute and I'm like, I have to research. And that's how we end up where we are today. So with that very long intro out of the way, let's get into it. This is the history of the black beauty. Get looking. I'll shut up. What do I care about that? He's only the manager. 
of the show. I'm the star. I'm the big star around here. Nobody tells me what to do. I tell them. <laughs> I'd love to work at Dennis. I do want a job as a secretary. And I could handle it. A house is residential or a lot of rented rooms. Let they crowd up full of beaten up, broken down characters from the back streets of Paul and let them go rent cringe. Why don't you hold the slipper in your hand? You know, the Cinderella slipper. It would give you more show than this. I didn't try the slipper. You could have all the money you could now. As always, I try to go as far back as I possibly can when it comes to these topics, but being that I talk about history as it pertains to the Black American experience and we know how America has done in preserving the history and culture of the Black American experience, <laughs> I was only able to go back about a hundred years or so. But black women have been concerned with beautification for centuries before that, as I mentioned before. And you can see that very clearly in my video on the Tinian Laws that I made some time back. If you guys want to go back and watch it, I'll leave a card. Let's focus on the black makeup industry and how it's grown and evolved. As far as I can see, it appears that the makeup industry in the black community can be tentatively traced back about 120 years or so. In the early 18th century, it was common for upper-class American men and women to wear makeup, but following the American Revolution, the use of cosmetics started to become socially unacceptable. Because cosmetics weren't manufactured in America, women relied on recipes that they circulated amongst family, friends, and women's magazines. These homemade cosmetics ranged from lotions and powders to skincare formulas meant to lighten complexions or naturally reduce the appearance of wrinkles, blemishes, and freckles. Considering that black women would have known how to mix up tinctures and tonics from a recipes passed down from our ancestors for a variety of things such as illnesses and hair care, I can only imagine that black women probably did something similar. They may have used natural ingredients such as eggs, lemon, honey, palm oil, avocado. There's no telling what sort of concoctions they may have whipped together for their own skincare routines. During the Victorian era, wearing visible makeup was considered vulgar and low class and it was associated with prostitution, but women would still use natural methods to bring color to their complexions. Crushed flower petals or berries, for example, could be used to stain the lips or rouge the cheeks, while ashes could be used to darken the eyebrows and lashes. It was all about having the natural white ideal of feminine beauty. See again, the natural white ideal of feminine beauty fair complexion with naturally rosy lips cheeks and bright eyes and i talked a little bit about this ideal in my history of black pinup models video where i discussed the gibson girl ideal by the 1880s with attitudes around women's rights shifting so too did attitudes about makeup and slowly but surely the beauty industry that we know today began to take shape in america one of the first black people to hop on this shift was a man by the name of anthony overton born into slavery in 1865 his family migrated to kansas after the american civil war where he attended public schools and in 1888 earned a bachelor of law degree from washington college this man rose out of slavery became a practicing attorney and a judge and he still wasn't satisfied because Overton actually wanted to be an entrepreneur and with his intellect keen instincts and a background in chemistry which will be relevant later he had the perfect idea in 1898, he moved to Kansas City, Missouri and used his savings of $2,000 or about $70,000 in today's money to start Overton Hygienic Manufacturing Company. Early on, he saw the potential in the beauty industry and recognized the untapped market in black women. He began conceptualizing a cosmetics range catering to black women's complexions and tastes. Overton was financially fruitful and began producing a line of perfume using his own in-house odor bases under a brand called High Brown. Despite the fact that white folks did what white folks do best and try to gatekeep black people out of building and creating things for ourselves, Overton was successful to the point that he was able to expand to an international market. And he began getting orders in places like Liberia and Japan. In 1911, he moved his company to Chicago and began employing a salaried workforce, which included 400 door-to-door -door sales reps. 
essentially providing jobs to the black community and circulating the black dollar. By 1915, production output was up to 62 products and Overton Hygienic Company was grossing $268,000, which isn't even a small number by today's standards, but is actually insane in the 1910s. Overton was alone, however. I can't very well make a video about the black beauty industry and not spotlight the black women pioneers of the industry, Annie T. Malone and Madam C.J. Walker, both of whom were juggernauts and pioneers in the black beauty industry. Annie T. Malone was actually Madam Walker's employer and mentor before Walker struck out on her own, and Annie created the first black cosmetology school in 1917, complete with a manufacturing plant, a retail store that sold her products, several business offices, a 500-seat auditorium, dining and meeting rooms, a rooftop garden, a dormitory, a gymnasium, a bakery, and a chapel. <laughs> Y'all... This is a woman who was born into slavery, whose mother had to escape, whose father went to fight in the Civil War, and she built this big of an empire that employed tens of thousands of black women regularly and spawned probably one of the greatest black entrepreneurs, black female entrepreneurs that we have ever known in American history. Can we just talk about how excellence is literally threaded in our DNA? Like, I see why people be mad. I see why y'all be mad. <laughs> So we can't discount Annie's legacy, not only because of everything that she did, but also because she actually became the wealthiest African-American in the country and the first in Missouri to own a Rolls Royce. Aside from Annie, there was also Madam Walker, who had a skincare products along with her hair care range. Here's an advertisement for Tan Off, which boasts the solution for sallow, blemished skin. But you might notice that it also promotes colorist ideals by going on to promote the lightening of dark complexions. We love Miss Walker, but again, even she was not free of the shackles of colorism. During the 1920s, it started to become more socially acceptable for women to wear makeup, especially with the emerging party scene that began to flourish in the late 1910s and early 20s. Women would lean towards a more subtle makeup look during the day and something heavier during the nighttime for when they were partying. This was likely due to the growing medium of the film industry where a lot of actresses wore heavy makeup in order for it to show up on camera. Black Jazz Age entertainers like Josephine Baker, Adelaide Hall, Ethel Waters, and Florence Mills wore makeup in their films and performances, and a new wave of cosmetics brands for black women began to emerge. Amongst these were Lucky Heart Cosmetics, Madam Jones, and Hi Hat, just to name a few. These brands took from Overton's marketing tool of treating black women like the valuable consumers that they were. Overton's marketing model included providing quality packaging with intricate and colorful designs, unlike the white brands that used shoddy, plain packaging in bland colors like black and white when they were advertising for black women. And that's if they decided to sell black cosmetics at all, as many stores refused to do so. This is why the model of door-to-door -door sales was so important and imperative to the emerging black beauty industry. Not only was it a great way to distribute products, but it was also providing the black community with much needed jobs. They also employed the tried and true tactic of using popular black celebrities of the time to advertise, like in this Lucky Hearts ad featuring Blanche Thompson endorsing their products. You also had black women using natural methods to brighten their skin and complexions like Josephine Baker who would mix honey and lemon together and rub them on her elbows or use it on her face in order to lighten her complexion naturally. At this point, you've probably noticed that much of this advertisement is extremely colorist, advertising bleaching creams with models no darker than a paper bag despite having foundations named tantalizing dark brown. Incidentally, their light-colored powders and foundations also have these sexually suggestive kind of creepy names such as Teasem Red. <laughs> Colorism benefits no one, but the variety of creams and bleaches peddled to dark-skinned women couldn't have felt great for dark-skinned ladies. Which brings me back to the question that sparked this video in the first place. What did dark-skinned women do for their makeup back in the day? Well, dark-skinned women were encouraged to wear richer shades like Blood Red, Cherry, and Ruby. Blushes were also recommended to match the lipstick in shade, but in a fainter application, so not necessarily in intensity. These were just a few beauty techniques that dark-skinned women could employ in their makeup application. During World War II, black women were continuing to work because, unlike white women, our ancestors never really had the luxury of resting on their laurels and letting men take care of us. So, I say all that to say that now beauty priorities had shifted. 
because of the shortage of goods which were being monopolized for the war makeup wasn't as readily available but women were still encouraged to do their part for the war effort by keeping pretty don't ask me how that helped but that's what the propaganda told them to do so <laughs> anywho they could accomplish this with the right hairstyle the war has complicated a lot of things so milady is timely with her hairstyle did you ever see anything more involved than the coiffures of these two lovelies girls as pretty as these shouldn't have to worry about how they fashion their dresses. But obviously, they want to be right in style. So what? So this? Looking at Iwo Jima, which graces many posters, now has found the top milady's head. It's the latest in coiffure ornament. Interested spectators view the hair creation. Never before has the hairdress been so important or elaborate. For jewels, flowers, combs, and other ornaments adorn the crowning glory of the fair sex. The short bob is obviously out, and the hair piled high seems to be in. A touch of lipstick and a bit of rouge. Because women were taking on more traditionally masculine jobs such as factory work and machinery work, skincare became a priority. Vanishing creams, cold creams, and blemish creams were in vogue to help protect women's skin. During the 1940s, Posner Cosmetics was founded, and it marketed a range of affordable and diverse cosmetics specifically geared towards black women of all socioeconomic backgrounds. So let's talk technique, shall we? Popular contemporary singer Joyce Bryant mentioned in an interview that she avoided wearing makeup aside from lipstick and lashes or mascara because the makeup of that era broke her out and was limited for dark skin. And I can imagine with all those damn skin bleaching agents in the products that makeup did break them out back then. Brown and dark skin beauties like Bryant or Hazel Scott emphasize their natural beauty with minimal products, dark lipstick, a little gloss, plucked brows, and mascara or lashes. There was also the trick of using brilliantine oil to the eyelids for shine. There was also the trick of Vaseline, and let me tell y'all, Vaseline was like a six in one. Women would use it as a makeup base or a primer. They would use it to highlight. They would use it for moisturizing benefits. They would use it to heal blemishes and reduce lines and things like that. They would also use it to keep their makeup on so that the makeup wouldn't, you know, go anywhere. Basically, kind of like their fixing spray, like what fixing spray would be for us now. So it was really a very multi-faceted beauty product and it's still available and it's still a really good product oh shit <laughs> side note there's also this really great picture of joyce bryant sort of laying down before one of her performances and she has a bowl of ice water what looks to be a bowl of ice water beside her and another skincare tip that a lot of old hollywood um, starlets and glamour girls would do is splashing their face with ice water because it helped to promote blood circulation it tightened your pores it freshened you up it kind of gave you like a little bit of a nice youthful fresh little like glow so I'm, I'm gonna bet that that's why she had the ice water beside her i could be wrong but if i had to guess i'm gonna bet that that's why she had it um starlets like joan crawford used to do this tip all the time used to use this trick all the time Dorothy Dandridge also had a signature look, which she achieved by combining pink and red lipstick to create her coral color. Her blush always complemented the warm undertones of her skin, and she emphasized her moles, which was a tip that she got from her makeup artist. Top it off with a soft eye look of brown or taupe eyeshadow, a little bit of eyeliner and mascara, and you have the most popular black actresses of yesteryear's makeup look. Speaking of popular black actresses, Lena Horne also got in on the beauty industry by creating her own makeup line called Lena Horne Cosmetics. And I can't say that I blame her, considering that Lena's studio, MGM, called in a makeup expert, Max Factor, to create a darkened shade of foundation for her called Light Egyptian to make Lena appear more black looking, only to turn around and put it on two white actresses so that those women could play black women in roles that should have gone to Lena.
Side note, Lena was passed up for a lot of roles due to her Eurocentric features and light skin, which were considered too reminiscent of white women's for the producers to place her opposite white men without white women's getting threatened and promoting miscegenation. However, this also meant she was considered too white looking to play opposite black men for fear that even the idea of a white looking black woman would promote miscegenation. Do I hear white fragility for 500? I can't find any surviving pictures of Lena Horne cosmetics, but from the certificate, it looks like she employed a similar model as Avon or Mary Kay in having trained artists doing door-to-door -door demonstrations. There was also the black supermodel between the 1950s and 60s who did the same thing. She started her own highly successful makeup company. However, I cannot remember her name, and I, I hate that so much because I would have loved to do a video on her. I would have loved to include more about her in this video, but... I'm sorry. If you guys know, please let me know in the comments. By the 1960s and 70s, you began to see darker models and actresses such as Cicely Tyson, Naomi Sims, Teresa Graves, etc. The Black Power movement didn't necessarily cure colorism, but it did force Black Americans and the American public to take a second look at dark-skinned women. One of these people was Eunice Johnson, wife of Jet Magazine publisher John H. Johnson. After noticing that black models had to mix pigments to achieve their color, usually with lackluster results, she started her own makeup line, Fashion Fair. And this was after attempting to work with large-scale makeup brands such as Revlon, who still stupidly did not see the value in tapping into the black market and turned her down. Considering that the Revlon founder, Charles Revson, actually had a relationship with Eartha Kitt that was apparently so impactful on his life that he named his most popular shade Fire and Ice after her. Yes, you heard that right. He named one of his most popular shades Fire and Ice, a lipstick that I remember still being advertised when I was a kid, after Eartha Kitt. I find it really funny and surprising that he didn't see the black beauty market as being you know fruitful or viable but i mean we do also have to take into consideration that he was too much of a racist coward to take the relationship any further for fear of ostracization so maybe maybe it's not so surprising mm. Anyway, Fashion Fair went on to become, unsurprisingly, the largest black home makeup company because it turns out inclusivity actually leads to more sales and more money. Who would have thought? Throughout the 1980s, black women were able to do more with their makeup than ever before because anything went in the 80s. The style got brighter, bolder, and more garish.